Thank you, Pat. It's great to be here today. I've been asked to talk to you today about the BEF Equality Group, but to do that, I would like to take you on a little journey. First, I need to explain, possibly, what equality, diversity and inclusion is. Some may know, but just in case you don't, equality, diversity, inclusion is making sure no one feels left out or discriminated against. It could be due to their age, ethnicity, gender, culture, language, disability, or some other factors. Diversity should be recognized in all areas of our work, and there should be an appreciation of how this can benefit your organization. Inclusion is ensuring everyone has the opportunity to be part of what you're offering or the service you are providing. This is also set down as law in an act, the Equality Act of 2010. The Act provides a legal framework to protect the rights of individuals and advance equality opportunities for all. It provides Britain with a discrimination law to protect individuals from unfair treatment and promotes a fair and more equal society. The Equality Act makes it unlawful for someone to be discriminated against because of one of those characteristics. It's important to remember in all of our work, we need to widen access and reduce inequalities of equestrianism from underrepresented individuals, groups and communities. A good way to remember this is based around two broad themes, developing your organisation and developing your service. BF, as part of the funding commitments to Sport England and UK Sport, have been addressing these as an organisation. We have been working on the equality standard for sport, which is a multi-agency quality mark across the four nations. Looking at organisational changes to address equality, diversity and inclusion. The equality standard works across four levels, foundation, preliminary, intermediate and advanced. Currently, the BEF are working towards advanced. We also have been working with our member bodies to help them become equality standard organisations as well. So far, BHS, British Dressage and Endurance are all at foundation level, with soon to be completed carriage driving, RDA and the Pony Club. The BEF has also completed equality impact assessments on all areas of development from strategy through to project development. This looks at how equitable and inclusive the piece of work is across all sectors of equality, diversity and inclusion and helps see where the gaps are and how we can address these. Whilst the BEF are working on the standard, we realise that we need some advice and guidance as an organisation from people who are working within equality strands of equestrianism or whom have left experience. We decided the best way to address this was to set up an equality engagement group consisting of representation from disability, young people, women and girls, LGBTQ, ethnic diverse communities and low social economic groups. We meet as a minimum quarterly and they have helped us form an action plan across the next two years. The members are able to support on building our marketing program profile of the BEF by sharing photos to increase the image rank, sharing stories of their centres to help us develop case studies around specific areas of the community, give advice and support on pinpointing what priorities will be for the BEF in 21-2022 calendar period and the focuses will be moving forward ethnic diverse communities. In 2011 the UK census shows that one in five people in England are from a black Asian and ethnic minority group which is about 20% of the population. This is projected to increase to two in five people by 2051 which is about 39.2% of the population. In January 2020 Sport England published a survey for, uh, on change for all, looking at ethnic diversity in sport and physical activity for both adults and young people. For adults, equestrianism wasn't even listed as an activity that this group want to engage with. This is not good. Within young people, equestrianism has a share of only 2.2% of young people actively engaged in horse riding. Again, this is not good. If we fail to address existing inequalities or engage more people from diverse ethnic backgrounds, it will only lead to, to greater challenges in overall levels of engagement in equestrianism in the long term for this group. To look at how we can address some of these inequalities in an organisation and support the wider sector, we have teamed up with Sporting Equals to develop an action plan along with the support of the EEG. 
This plan looks at representation within the workforce of the board, training, resource development for guidance, and in the perception of um, equestrianism from equality and diversity communities, both within and outside of the sector. The EEG are integral to the partnership with Sport and Equals and will support their superb no with and will support, sorry, with their superb knowledge around the local communities and the subject areas within equestrianism. The second area the group will be doing supporting with is through two projects. Because we recognise the fact that there are inequalities in our sport, we wanted to support young people to see that being part of a question is and is for them. After consulting with the question groups as part of the EEG, we have developed a youth project to raise inclusion, equality and aspirations in equestrian sport within workforce, which is linked to participation and youth education, which is linked to talent. These projects were focused on all areas of equality and diversity. Within Workforce Coach Development Project, we are upskilling the existing volunteer coaching workforce, working in centres who are providing riding opportunities for underrepresented youth groups. Coaches will provide and support deliver and deliver a better riding experience, develop and rise aspirations of riders from a, from a diverse background and demonstrate to them that there are a pathway and a career in the questionism industry and in time will help improve diversity in the workforce. In the youth development programme, the aims is to provide a youth education platform which delivered, is delivered within the centres providing riding opportunities for underrepresented groups. We hope it will give a rounded understanding of horsemanship and opportunities to gain qualifications, such as the Pony Club Test or the BHS Challenge Award. It will also showcase and offer various branches of opportunities that exist within the industry to raise aspiration and gain a feeling of achievement. Where possible, this will be delivered alongside the Coach Development Project. Both these projects are in the early stages of development and we look forward to seeing them develop and encourage a wider section of the community into our sport. We are working with selected member bodies to help us deliver these. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jess. We're now going to take the opportunity to look at the work of BIRTH, the BAME Equine and Rural Activities Focus Group. Sandra Murphy, who's the founder and chairperson of BIRTH, and Navratan, Parthiban, Thebe, are going to talk about the importance of diversity and inclusivity within the equine sector and how they feel diversity can be progressed within this sector. Thank you, Sandra and Thebe. Hello, my name is Thebe, and I'm joined today by the founder of BIRTH, Sandra. In the next 10 minutes, we're going to be focusing on BIRTH, the BAME Equine and Rural Activities Focus Group, who we are, how we came about, and what we do. The sect equine sector, according to the BETA survey 2019, employs up to 270,000 people directly and indirectly. They're estimated to be 3 million riders and 27 million people have some interest in the horse industry. In 2020, when other industries and sports are pushing for change and a modern image, the equine industry needs to do the same. Historically, there have always been barriers to entering and working the equine sector for the BAME community. Very little work has been done on this in the UK and there are no definitive sources to refer to on how we can work better to improve quality, diversity and inclusivity for our sector. The conversation has recently started on improving diversity and inclusion in the equine industry. However uncomfortable it may be, it is important that we have all these conversations to help increase the awareness of the problem and promote thought on solutions. Sandra will now go on to founding of BIRTH and its mission. Hello. Many people may hear may know me as I've been involved with the nutrition for the past seven years and have been working with horses for over 50 years. Having developed the world's first liquid feed for horses back in 2014, I'm the only black woman in the world to have gained a European patent for the a liquid equine feed and pioneered the concept of equine nutritional hydrotherapy. To have solved the centuries old problem, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink, is a modern day breakthrough for our domesticated horses. Even having won the British Black Business Awards in October of 2020, this groundbreaking British achievement has largely gone unnoticed by the equine industry in the UK, despite our best efforts. 
If you are unaware of this, then this is a good example of why it is so important to represent the underrepresented in our sector. Being so underrepresented in my industry, I felt that my voice was not being heard. Therefore, in July of 2019, shortly after the George Floyd incident, I was compelled by my experience in the equine industry and the Black Lives Matter movement to ask the question, how do we increase equine equality and diversity in the equine industry? This was met by a huge backlash from members of a 10,000 strong equine social media group, which was subsequently shut down by the platform because of the severity of the racial abuse that I received. I decided I needed to do something to take positive action to help find a solution to, to some of the issues that BAME people had been experiencing for decades. I founded a social media group called BAME Equine and Rural Activities Focus Group, BIRTH, bringing together members of diverse communities who were keen to share their own experiences and make a change. Well, we are the change by providing a safe environment to bring those individuals and families together to welcome all positive suggestions, ideas, strategies and funding initiatives that may help to engage, promote and support members to also allow exposure to media opportunities, campaigns and initiatives to highlight BAME participation in a wide range of activities not restricted to equine, but any activity, pursuit or aspiration available within the uh, rural setting. I have seen the group grow to over 350 members with BAME equestrians, trainers, coaches, lawyers, academics, vets, also supporters from large organisations, universities to individuals and families. We are the change by forming a working committee of people from various backgrounds to bring a diverse of, diversity of thought, experiences, abilities and innovation to the table. We hold regular committee meetings with guest speakers from the industry and open meetings with the wider social media group. Both are steadily raising the awareness of the experiences people of colour have had throughout their equestrian journeys. From this, we have been able to provide suggestions for the BEFEG to explore, and we directly influence the direction of these initiatives, such as the rollout of unconscious bias training, as well as the BAME Charter working with Sport and Equals to deliver this particular project. We are the change by, we form collaborative projects with outside agencies, such as the Bridge of Hope, who support underrepresented groups. They provide funding for young people to take up careers in horse racing industry, and together we have a birth member starting at the British Racing School in September. We also have a very well established four star eventer teaming up with a talented young birth eventer and um, hopefully as a mentor. We also help and support more established BAME riders to further their careers. There, is, there are some of the, these are some of the practical actions that we are taking right now to start to develop young BAME role models for the future theme. As a vet, my profession and the equine sector share a lot of similarities. We have a huge lack of diversity in our profession. And again, a lot of the barriers are the similar to the equine sector. So at the moment, I'm running a landmark survey, racism survey, looking at vets, vet techs, vet nurses, receptionists, to see where are the issues and therefore what actions can we take to break down those barriers. I'm also doing a Nuffield Farming Scholarship um, sponsored by McDonald's UK and Ireland to look at supporting and promoting ethnic minorities in farming, agriculture and the veterinary profession. Again, that's going to give me some examples of how we can improve um, situations, increase inclusivity and break down some barriers. So in a year's time, hopefully we can learn from some of those things. Other things that Sandra's already mentioned are things like birth writing articles in journals. Sandra herself has done some and again, members of our committee are available to do that. Linda, who is a colleague and a member of our birth committee and is also head of diversity and inclusion at Hartbury University, has done a lot of work looking at education and recently at Lantra, which is a land based association, education association, she got agreement for them to work with birth to include increase inclusion and diversity. Um, Sandra mentioned earlier that we have um, do, do a lot of networking, have invited speakers and people that we've had, for example, include David Butler at the BEF, James Fellows at Bridge of Hope, uh, Marcus Capel at Pony Club and others. So again, networking is really, really important. Sandra is now going to talk about moving forward and future plans for birth. So 
So yes, thank you. Yes, so basically, Birth have identified that there is a progression gap that most inner city bone riders fall into, and so have drafted a proposal for a stepping stone type purpose built facility called BRAIS, which stands for BAME Equine and Rural Activities Centre of Excellence. The B-Race will be able to resolve many of the challenges which are hindering the progression of BAME riders and also to cater for their cultural, religious and practical needs. B-Race is proposed to be a residential site where the inner city riding schools and other organisations who currently introduce BAME riders to equine sports and activities can identify their talented young people to be able to progress them in any discipline or rural activity. From providing elite level training and competition level horsepower to providing placements for potential equine veterinary students in a rural setting. Lincolnshire currently has a wealth of elite level equine coaches, facilities and opportunities. Therefore, having B-Race located in this county may encourage more BAME families to relocate to more rural areas such as Lincolnshire because it's one of the least BAME represented counties in the country. Introducing a residential facility um, with an infrastructure in a rural setting to be able to, to for BAME people would mean that progression can be made safely on a level playing field with a, with a, within a relatively short period of time. It would also allow for non-BAME, uh, non-equine BAME people to become involved in areas such as veterinary and farriery with placements at local practices, work experience at rural farms, and courses at local agricultural colleges. If we work together as an industry, the B race could become a reality for the BAME community. And to have our own centre with our own unique heritage will mean that our roots will be firmly embedded in a centre, in a centre that in 50 years time, our grandchildren can look back and see the legacy that was created for them. See. So we have an opportunity as a sector, as an industry, to take ownership and take responsibility for improving diversity and inclusion. This will involve increasing our awareness and increasing our awareness means get data gathering, doing more surveys, finding out how many people from ethnic minorities are in our sector, what are their feelings, what are their barriers, increasing our education, funding the education and seeking the education. We also need to have more positive role modelling and uplift and platform people that are breaking the mould in our sector. So again, it has to be top down approach. So any leaders in our sector need to take this as a priority uh, and we need to work together to do this. Thank you, Sandra. So it is vital if we want a sector that welcomes people from all walks of life, we must look up, speak up, and challenge ourselves no matter how uncomfortable the conversation gets. We must work together as an industry to embrace and empower BAME people in any way we can to become involved in the industry. We are all very lucky to live and work with horses. So it is up to us to encourage others to join us and feel like they belong too and can be themselves. Not only is it morally right to push for equality, diversity and inclusivity, but also to allow for a more sustainable business model. We must not be tempted to just tick boxes and shuffle papers. We must take action as the time is now. Our industry, which holds high moral values, not only benefits from its members, but also seen to as a positive example for other industries in the UK to follow and support. Thank you, Sandra. So to conclude, and as we've discussed, the current equine sector is not diverse and inclusive in many ways. And it's up to all of us to take personal responsibility to help change this. The journey will be uncomfortable and it will take some time. But there are BAME-led organisations such as ourselves and Imran at St James City Farm who are here to represent and support an industry that we all belong to. This must not, this must not be the end but the beginning of conversation, education and action to make the equine sector where everyone can belong and thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thebe and Sandra. Our next presentation comes from the racing sector, where Rose Grizel, Head of Diversity and Inclusion at the British Horse Racing Authority, will give an overview of horse racing's diversity and inclusion journey, sharing some examples of initiatives and activity across all areas of diversity and inclusion, including LGBT plus inclusion, 
what they've learned and their priorities for the year ahead. Please do remember to submit your questions via Slido. Over to you, Rose. Thank you, Pat. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to give a quick uh, overview, really, of the diversity and inclusion activity in racing. And to start with why it's really important to British racing um, to become a bit more diverse and inclusive. So we've already seen um, from Jess uh, the moral, legal and uh, governance case uh, for why diversity and inclusion is, is really important. But for us, there's a really strong commercial case too. We know that the UK population is becoming more diverse. And so as a sport, if we're to survive even, or um, as I hope is to grow and thrive, we really feel that there's a, a fantastic opportunity here um, to enable us to attract wider audiences as racing fans, as customers, as owners, future employees and participants, um, as well as to attract um, corporate sponsorship as well as we've seen in other sports. So how diverse and inclusive is British racing? So we're one of the most attended sports by women, much higher than other mainstream sports, which is a, a real positive. We also um, are unique in the fact that all genders can meet, compete on equal terms, like other equestrian sports, but unique to other mainstream sports. The likes of Bryony Frost, Holly Doyle have been breaking barriers um, and breaking records year on year. And that's something we really, really want to celebrate and promote. We also um, have a great role model in Victoria Smith, top right corner here, a former professional jockey and the first person to ride as both a male um, and a transgender woman. We're also unique in, in a sport um, in the fact that we have um, certain people with certain disabilities can compete on equal um, terms as well. So here pictured we have Guy Disney who has uh, a prosthetic leg. Obviously there has to be safety, um, has to be safe to do so, but we, we are as inclusive as possible there as well. We have good ethnic diversity amongst our racing staff as well. Uh, pictured here, James Frank winning last year's uh, Stud and Stable Staff Awards and Imran Shawani, um, enables um, former groom. But it's also important for us to note that this cultural diversity um, is not a spread across the whole sport, but only in certain areas. So building on that, we understand we've got a really long way to go still. Um, there are a number of inequalities that still exist, um, as in wider society and in other sports. And here are just some stats to um, evidence that. So 26% of jockeys are female, um, yet they only get 9% of all rides and as low as 4% in the top races. This, so this indicates the inequalities that exist. Um, however, as I've said previously, this is increasing year on year, but we, we're really keen to see how we can accelerate that progress. One in eight of the working age population are from black minority ethnic backgrounds, yet of the 59 race courses in the UK, only one black minority ethnic executive in, is in the position of general manager or clerk of the course. And we've only ever had one openly gay jockey in the weighing room, despite research is suggesting that 6% of jockeys are lesbian, gay or bisexual. So it's a really important to, to take stock of um, what we know and this evidence. And this has really helped us to drive um, the, this agenda forward as an industry. So in 2017, the Diversity and Racing Steering Group was formed. Our vision is for British racing to be a diverse and inclusive sport in which everyone has the opportunity to achieve their potential within the sport and where fans of all communities feel welcome. We're currently focusing on four key objectives, um, which I'll quickly run through now um, and share some of the, the um, initiatives in place um, to address them. So firstly, raising awareness of the importance of diversity and inclusion across the whole sport. We've worked really hard on um, embedding uh, best practice and an understanding of why diversity and inclusion is important across our senior stakeholders across the sport. And this is because we understand that um, diversity and inclusion should be embedded into everyday, normal, day-to-day uh, -day practice and life about how we can be truly inclusive as a sport. And 
So we are working towards um, publishing an industry commitment and all key stakeholders uh, driving and um, um, delivering their own action plans too. Secondly, better understanding British racing's landscape. Um, this is really so that we can understand where the main issues are and the challenges that exist, but also so that we can monitor progress and see what, what's working and what's not. So we're working um, on specifically this year to look how we can start to monitor the diversity of racing's workforce and participants. Thirdly, creating an inclusive sport for all and fourthly increasing riding opportunities for female jockeys so I'll just now share some uh, key examples of initiatives that we've um, undertake, undertaken recently and also things that we have hope to do in future which will um, address these, these third and fourth objectives. So firstly looking at improving gender diversity uh, we have a fantastic organisation um, in women in racing, uh, as well as initiatives like the Silk series, which really promote and um, encourage uh, female participation and um, progress within the sport. We've recently done some research looking to identify the hidden and subtle barriers that are in place for female jockeys. And we're really looking to see what changes we can make um, to help uh, jockeys overcome these barriers, but also how we remove them as well. Secondly, looking at attracting um, young people from diverse uh, backgrounds and specifically ethnically diverse backgrounds into the sport. Um, we're working on developing a clear and inclusive talent development pathway um, through projects like the Pony Racing Authority Pathway, um, initiatives like Take the Reins, which work with inner city groups and the Step on Track programme, which is uh, an entry um, programme for young people from diverse ethnic communities. We're also um, hopefully going to carry out some research this year to better understand why ethnic minority communities don't um, come racing. So that's something that we're really keen to learn from and see what we can, uh, um, how we can adapt and address those issues. Looking at disability, so race courses have really been leading the way in this area. We've seen the Jockey Club develop accessibility guides for all their race courses and incredible projects like Go Racing Green, um, which provides opportunities for people who may be struggling with mental health conditions, anxiety or isolation. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to get close to horses and spend the day at the races in a, in a safe um, environment. And kind of finally, I just wanted to touch on some of our work that we've done um, to promote LGBT plus inclusion. There was some research carried out a, a few years ago, which looked at uh, LGBT inclusion in the sport. And it identified that there was quite um, a high percentage of the LGBT plus community that didn't feel safe coming out in the sport. But at the same time, the research also showed that people generally have really positive attitudes towards people coming out. So we identified that there's work to be done to address um, potentially a difference between the reality and the, the perception. So we developed a LGBT awareness and inclusion e-learning um, tool, which has been one of the most popular modules um, produced on our Racing to Learn platform. Um, secondly, we developed the Racing with Pride um, network, which is a community of people, LGBT plus community, as well as allies who can come together and help, help um, the industry kind of progress LGBT plus inclusion. And finally, we also took part in Stonewall's Rainbow Laces campaign, which is a sport wide um, LGBT plus inclusion campaign. We created our own campaign called Racing is Everyone Sport, where we share, shared um, case studies and real life stories from um, members of the LGBT plus community in racing and shared how um, their stories and experiences, as well as kind of promoting allies through that campaign as well. We had um, jockeys wearing rainbow armbands and other officials on the race day wearing rainbow arm armbands to give that visible support um, on the race course. And finally, just to, to wrap up, um, this all this work around uh, equality um, has been underpinned by 
uh, a tool, an anonymous reporting tool called RaceWise, which stands for Welfare, Integrity, Safeguarding and Equality. This is an anonymous and confidential um, platform for people to report any kind of discrimination or abuse that they um, that is related to a protected characteristic. Um, so this tool is really to help us um, encourage uh, stamping out any kind of homophobia, sexism or racism. And we're really trying to promote um, that uh, tool so that people feel confident in calling things out um, and so that we can stamp out any kind of inappropriate behaviour that may restrict anyone from feeling included or being able to be their true selves within the sport. So I think that's a brief, um, brief tour from me. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them and please use the Slido. Thank you. Thank you for these insights, Rose. Our final presentation is a very exciting case study from inner city Gloucester. Imran Achka, who's the coordinator at St. James City Farm Riding School, which is based in the very heart of the city, talks about his own personal journey to the horse world and the reason for the establishment of the riding school, including the benefits to children and adults alike. He will also touch on the challenges of running the riding school in this inner city and give some examples of their work. Over to you, Imran. Hi, thank you for inviting me to speak at the National Equine Forum 2021. My name is Imran Acha and I'll be taking you through a 10 minute whistle stop tour of our riding school and how and why it's been established. St. James City Farm, we have now a 20 by 40 meter outdoor all weather arena and seven stables. We're situated bang in the middle of inner city Gloucester. It's a vibrant area of multiculturalism. There's about 50 languages spoken in one square mile, but our ward is in one of the least green areas per population. In fact, in the country, we are in the middle of the concrete jungle, although the county itself is very green. We have sadly the typical figures you'd expect in inner city areas, socio-economic disadvantage figures, in terms of higher unemployment, crime, poorer health, lower physical activity and education levels. But um, this is our, our area and um, I'm, I'm quite proud of the area. I like the area, I'm born and brought up in this area. Most kids will never have seen horses close up. It's just not something that in, their, in the mindset, it's just not something that they'll come across. It's always something that other people will do. It's one of those, you know, perceived as a, for rich people or posh people. And especially if you're from the black and uh, or the ethnic minority community, you're not going to have anything to do with horses or know, know of anybody else generally. Even if they did consider it, this is generally these people from lower incomes, even from middle middle income. And the sums would be, for, for most, would be, you know, out of their range. If you break it down, Riding costs, you know, anything from 25 to 50 pounds a lesson, like a half an hour lesson at least. And to learn properly, you'll need a minimum of, you know, once a week over several months. Plus you need the transport to get to the school and you might not have a car. You may have two or three kids and you may be single parents, you may be unemployed or from a single income household, lower income. It's, it's just out, out of the question. Basically, it's another world. And even if you do turn up to one of these places, you manage to scrape together enough for a lesson, then everyone's looking horsey. No one looks like you, no one that you can identify or relate to, you know, so it's, it's just not considered. How we got to this stage, we've got to go back several decades, really. The story goes back to myself having this passion for horses. I've always had this passion for horses, but I just didn't know how to achieve it. And I've had the odd lessons. Um, they were mainly in a group or just trekking in the countryside where you don't really actually learn how to ride. All I wanted to do was, you know, gallop and learn how to ride properly, but I couldn't even trot properly. And in fact, I remember I told an instructor I wanted to gallop and the instructor said, you know, you will never gallop. At that stage, I said, I don't like this. I'm, I'm going to go off and do my own thing. So I continued my research through books and everything and um, persuaded a friend of mine who had a passion as well uh, to join me for a two day horse owner course. And the instructor who was Sam Goss, based at Hartbury College at the time, she made it a lot more accessible. She said, you, you know, you can get a saddle for £200 or you can pay £2,000. If you're committed and you want to put the time and the effort in, you, then you can actually own a horse. And at the same time, I come across a friend of mine who told me he'd bought a field and he's going to buy a pony for his daughter. Uh, again, he's from the ethnic minority background, but he had some connection and he was going to take the step as well. 
So with no real clue, I, uh, anything about horses, I persuaded four other friends, five of us put 500 pounds each. So we, we bought this cob for two and a half thousand pounds. We bought this horse. I didn't even know how to put a head collar on. I had to ask somebody who was walking through the field once how to, how to, put, the, how to put the head collar on. But within a few days, we got the basics. or well, we thought we knew we had the basics. Um, and it was all very poor, but it was fantastic fun. It, it, was, just, it was just so much fun. And for two years, I looked after that horse. And, and, and learnt basics of riding or staying on at least. At the same time, through my youth and community work, I somehow managed to get a grant for seven and a half thousand pounds from county council for a pony plus an instructor to pay for lessons because I had a scheme in mind where I'd spoken to the city farm, which was run by the council at the time, and um, arranged to put this pony there. So we, we bought the pony, but then the plan fell through. Um, I had nowhere to put the pony. So um, we approached Hartbury College and uh, Jeremy Michaels at the time, who was the director of uh, Equine, he agreed to um, uh, us keeping the pony there, using it for lessons um, on the weekends and their students using it during the weekdays. It was about 10 years ago, and we were busing kids out to treks and to Harper College and a couple of other places to learn on Charlie and other, others. Uh, we were going for about 20 kids a year, three kids a time, learning the basics of um, horse care. Just a very, very basic introduction. And then my brother, who was a very good fundraiser, he put a proposal to um, the Wooden Spoon Rugby Charity to build our own arena, because by this time on, the charity I worked for had taken over the city farm. And we'd had the idea from uh, the Ebony Riding Club project in Brixton. Uh, you know, you can have a riding in the re arena in the middle of the city. And I'd had um, several conversations with their founder, Roz Spearing, went through the possibilities and were building up contacts and supporters for the idea. Cut a long story short, three years later, um, and 67, 60 or 70 thousand pounds later, this arena is established. We now work with um, local schools. There's five primary schools within walking distance of us, and then there's local children, and then some of those who help out, like Harper College students or work experience students, and um, local horsey people, others who we've come across, others who want to learn. Some know something, some don't have, you know, some are completely at the beginning. Because of my own experience, we want to make sure that no one is excluded on financial grounds. So we charge £2.50 for a lead rein, £5 for a 25-minute lesson, and free if you volunteer or if you can't afford it. Um, uh, most of the lessons are one-to-one, -one, um, where BHS approved, and all our instructors are qualified. And anything between, this is pre-COVID, anything between 25 to 50 children can have a ride each week. We've taken the kids to see events, you know, Olympia, or the Monty Robert show, or eventing, or taking part in pony racing, and just on a day-to-day -day basis learning about general care and riding. We still see ourselves very much as finding our way and adjusting continually, because logistically it is actually very hard to keep horses in the middle of the city without them grazing, but it is achievable. We get good feedback from the teachers, parents, kids themselves, and we don't need to persuade anybody about the benefits of horses, it's all well known. You meet horsey people, some would say, you know, they sat on a horse before they went in a pram or I've been riding X number of years, but, you know, we say, I, I, I say, I don't know much, but I got more passion and skill. And our kids, if you support them, they'll be as good as any, any others. Just, just give them a chance. And that's what we're all about. We're just about giving kids a chance. I must um, emphasize that while I've talked about my own journey and um, my role in, the, in setting up this riding school, this project has been an enterprise um, over many years with lots of different people um, in the background. Um, so, for instance, we've had donations from a child who's come up with a piggy bank that they've broken and come up with a few pennies to a local person who came to us and says, here's some money, go and get yourself a wheelbarrow, so all these kind of little things, to a businesswoman, uh, you know, um, who, um, who has a shirt factory in, the, in, the, um, in, in Gloucester. And she said to us, she heard about our troubles we've had with transport and she bought us a four by four for 25,000 pounds and then got her friends together to get us a, to, to buy us a trailer, which we need for transport because we're in, we're in the city and we need to move them off the grazing land. Um, so we have support from all sorts of people, local volunteers, college students, you know, so it, it's, it's a big community enterprise. So I, I really want to emphasize that it's not something that one person can do. Um, by themselves um, and thank you for listening. Hello, 
and thank you very much Imran for that very thought-provoking and powerful talk. So we now have a short question and answer session and I would like to start by asking each of the panelists a key question that has been sent in. So what the first question is, what does the panel feel are the main reason that these ethnic diverse communities have less interest and involvement in our industry? And could I start with you, Sandra? Um, yes, thank you, Pat. Um, well, basically, one of the main challenges is that um, they don't seem to have uh, a lot of parents, maybe the parents don't have knowledge on equine and they can't pass that down to the children. Or one of the other issues is, you know, location, demographic. A lot of Bain people live in uh, communities that are in, in the city and they don't have the rural infrastructure. So it's one of those things that really needs a lot of time and maybe and finances putting in and it has a lot to do with finances as well. So it, it does challenge those those communities and you know unless you've got the knowledge and you've got that sort of um, understanding of the industry it's very difficult to you know to move forward and become uh, role models in that in the area. Q and, and Jess? Um, I completely agree with what Sandra's just said and also to add um, people from diverse ethnic backgrounds aren't necessarily seeing other people from diverse ethnic backgrounds taking part in question so they won't always see that it's an option for them we have the same across all the equality groups from disability LGBTQ plus it's the same thing if people aren't seeing people like them they won't think that that opportunity is for them to do and they're also there's a lot of worry around what the ramifications might be if they do go to these events and are having problems at the events or when they're going to riding sessions at centres it's something that puts people off so by producing and showing that riding is for everybody is going to open the doors to everybody to be able to attend. And Steve? Um, I'd agree with the, the previous two speakers and um, I think it's, it's a huge topic we haven't got time really to go through every factor but things like role models and seeing you know it's being what you can see and um, definitely what Sandra was saying was access um, so again, the financial implications as well as transport implications, um, and, I, and I think that they, those are those are three of the big big factors. Great, and, and Rose, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what all the other panels panelists have said. But just to add, kind of, I guess on that element of role modelling as well, I think we've identified that we're really not reaching out and engaging with certain groups. Um, we're if you simply look on our race courses, for example, and our marketing materials, generally you do not see diverse um, images within those kind of materials. And that's a really basic thing that we can start to do, start to speak and engage to different groups um, and different people. And, and Imran, very important, especially in the area that you're working. Yeah, it's, a uh, well, um, perception is a big thing. That, um, of riding anyway from anybody from any background you know it's always thought of as something as a bit elitist and um, needing lots of money um, which in some extent to some extent yeah you do need money but um, uh, and even I had that impression when um, a, a long time ago but if you know over over a period of time I got to know a lot of people who are from you know relatively you know so-called ordinary backgrounds who are involved in in, in horse world but from the ethnic minority background there's the added barrier of not seeing anybody from your from your own background and uh, I think that's very important but we're slowly making headway and I'm, and I'm learning especially through birth and through uh, other now as my um, knowledge base is expanding that there are people who are who are involved but it's a matter of getting getting together and getting getting more out, out there but if you've got the passion and I think you you you, there are there are ways as we've seen with our, our riding school and with the other riding schools that are in the cities um uh, other people who just think you can get make a breakthrough yeah and following on from that there was another question that's a very general question and i think it applies to all of us and the question was what actions can we all take as members of the equine industry to ensure it's as inclusive as possible because it is up to all of us so i think i'd really like you to ask you 
what you think we can all do to help. So again, so could, could I cut with you, Rose? Yeah, I think I think that's a really important question and something that um, I always try and encourage everyone to, to think about. Um, I think personally, it's around kind of uh, education as well. I mean, this, this subject um, is, is vast and it can be um, quite uncomfortable at times, as I think it's already been mentioned in some of the presentations. Um, so I would just encourage people to um, go and introduce themselves to someone who is from a different community from them, uh, speak to them, understand about their experiences, listen and learn, and just try and um, understand how other people um, experience the world. And then it will help you to understand what you can do um, to, to ensure that they can be more included in, in whatever um, realm that is within the industry. And, and see from the veterinary side in particular, do you have a comment? Yeah, so I think um, I think it's it's the same for veterinary, farming, agriculture, or equine. It's a journey, and I think there's two layers to it. There's the individual responsibility and the systemic responsibility. But as an individual, I think being aware of your biases, your prejudices, or your shortcomings, and then moving on to the education side, where Again, social media is brilliant. You don't need to get out of your chair to start to listen to other voices and meet other people um, and, and, and start to read and, and educate yourself before then working on actual systems or, 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 or ways of actually breaking down barriers and increasing inclusivity. Jess, do you have something to add? Yeah, so you need to understand and find out what the perception is of your particular area within a question from people from ethnic diverse backgrounds and other equality groups. If you don't know what the perception is of the people that you're working with and for, then you're not going to be able to improve that. The other thing you need to think about is, it's already been mentioned, but how you're marketing your sport. So... Um, it's already been said across horse racing that um, the images that you're seeing are very white male images. If they change to being what the representation is that you want, then that will help others to see that that sport is for them and that opportunity is for them to get involved. And the other thing, just finally from my side, is just to say organisations need to be seen to be stamping out inequalities. They need to be seen to be doing things about problems that arise. If that's not happening, then people won't feel comfortable and, and, and secure and safe coming to your sport and activity. So we do need to address those awkward, hard, difficult situations that arise and not just say it's not really for me to deal with because it's for us all to deal with. And Imran... Can you pick up on that? Yeah, I think um, different places can, and different people or organizations can do different things depending on, um, you know, their capacity. But in, in um, from from our side, what we found is very useful has been some mentoring. So for example, myself, I got mentored by Jeremy Michaels, who's a fellow of the British Horse Society, to help me through some of the stages. And then my um, other, um, one of our, racing students or pony racing students she's being mentored by um, Sophie Leach from uh, Racing Stables and I, I think that personal local touch a friendly touch basically is a human touch has been really useful from our angle but in, in future I'd like to see the mentors be from similar backgrounds and I know um, like Steve's running something uh, to do with vet mentoring and I've had a student from an ethnic minority background and um, I'm, I've, I've, I've told her about this, this, the mentoring scheme, so I, I think that's one thing. And then we get we get support from places like Hartbury College in terms of expertise or um, uh, other places which give us financial support. So it's it's there's lots of different ways of running different things. And then there's, some things are like understanding different needs of different communities. So we have um, uh, when I went to, when I used to go to Hartford College, and sometimes it would be my prayer time, and I would say to them, oh, "Can I borrow a room and they'd let me use the room for a few minutes for the prayer?" So these kind of like little tweaks. It doesn't really cost money or anything, but it's just like little bits of understanding and just being supportive. I think. And Sandra, the final comment from you? Yeah, I do believe that uh, we need some more representation at management level um, of fame represent fame people at management level because we do not have that uh, level that we can um, you know influence um, you know, inclusivity at that level so we do need to look at looking at 
puts in more BAME people in those um, positions and also to actually listen, to listen to BAME people in the industry and to listen to their experiences and give them an opportunity because unless we are all working together, we're not going to achieve the goal. It, it takes a long time to develop, especially in riding, to, to develop the skills that are required for BAME people to excel and for anybody to excel, it takes time. And so we need to start that process now because now is the time. And if we leave it any longer, it's going to take even longer to actually create this legacy that we need to create for BAME people moving forward. So, you know, we all need to sit up, we all need to listen, we all need to speak, and we all need to have those conversations. It is going to be uncomfortable. It really is, but we need to do it to move forward. Thank you. And, and we have so many questions and an awful lot of congratulations. And I'd just like to end with just read very quickly one that says congratulations to all these groups for their efforts. This will help all people and the equestrian industry, as I think that this industry has been inappropriately considered to be only rich elitist and so undeserving of support in the way that other sports have done. Great to share the joy of horses with all. Thank you.